incorporating memories and so forth of, of salvation experiences. The name of that book was Jumping Through Fire. So if you want to go on Amazon and, and check it out, you can read a synopsis. See a picture. I can't even remember the guy's name. Iranian young fellow. Uh, his testimony. So uh, that's about that. All right. Uh, let's have a quick word of prayer. And uh, Father, thank you that uh, uh, we, you, you know what we need. Uh, you know who we are. And Father, you know what's on you. You supply everything. Uh, you're so good, wise, powerful, uh, righteous, uh, holy. You see things as they really are. And Father, as we just bathe ourselves in that unchanging reality of who you are, Father, we know that you will be working in and through us uh, just as, as uh, vessels today. Father, may you be seen, may your son be seen, and we I pray this because of all that he's accomplished on our behalf. Amen. We've been looking at uh, this uh, subject of uh, uh, correct thinking needs to be uh, uh, established in our minds, and it's an ongoing thing, uh, so that we can uh, act out of those thoughts. What we come to this morning is, is a subject of, uh, uh, we, in fact, do we have, oh, we have it up here. Okay, uh, my wife said we might not be able to put them up here. And the only reason I say that is if we didn't have it up here, uh, hopefully we had the notes for that because uh, you'll see there's different things and I'm, when I'm done speaking and go, oh, I, I, I skipped over that. Oh, I, I want to go back and say, no, I can't, I don't have time for all that. So we, that's good that's up here. We have a struggle to think correctly. Uh, it's not just this issue of, I want, I want good thoughts, and, and okay, we went over some of those things from Scripture for a New Testament believer, that's great. But we have competing thoughts, and that's what we want to <coughs> look at for a while this morning. Uh, under the Mosaic Law, uh, the Mosaic Law was given never to make anybody righteous. In fact, uh, uh, in, in Galatians chapter 2, Peter, uh, Paul uh, mentioned that to Peter. Uh, and I'm not going to go through the background of, of how that came about, but they went toe to toe on this. Peter was had been living by grace at a, a moment in the church in Antioch, and uh, uh, he he was uh, influenced by some Jewish Christians that came down. And under the law, you weren't supposed to have that close association. So he he removes himself. He was doing the right thing, and then he he removes himself from that. And Paul went toe to toe, nose to nose with him. Because he says there in Galatians 2, Peter was to be blamed. And in that conversation, he's talking to Peter. And there's other Jewish Christians that, that dissembled with Peter because of his activities. And he, he makes a statement about, we know that nobody's justified by law. You know that, Peter, and I know that, Peter. Everybody knows. Everybody here, we know it. <coughs> Not justified by so. What was the purpose of the law? Very quickly, take your Bibles. Romans chapter five. Romans chapter five. The law was given to Israel because they presumptuously made a claim, and God took them up on that claim in Exodus chapter nineteen, verse eight, where they said, "All that the Lord says, we will do." If you look at the previous verses in Exodus uh, uh, nineteen. God didn't tell them to do anything. In fact, he's mentioning a covenant, and most everybody assumes it's the one that's going to be made. And nobody knows anything about this law covenant, this Mosaic covenant. God was re uh, telling Moses about a covenant that they were already under, the Abrahamic covenant. A covenant that God swore by himself, one of two covenants. That he, gave to Abraham. he swore by himself, I'm going to do this, I'm going to give you the land. And I'm not expecting you to do a thing. You don't have to think, and yet Israel, even though they're all blood relatives of Abraham, most of them were unbelievers, they weren't believers like Abraham, there were some within the, the relatives, the, the offspring, because they, they were most of them unbelievers, they really didn't know how to live by faith and try and collect on this land promise, that, that's, and it took so long, it was at least 400 years from when it was made, and so they go, they just make this, this presumptuous. All that the Lord says we will do. So God gave them as proxy for the whole world a list of rules, righteous rules, good rules that were in keeping with uh, God's character that 
if they thought that they could keep that, and then there would be a bargain in there that if you do this, then there's all these blessings that, that uh, I'll give you if you do your part of the bargain. Well, the whole, the whole purpose of the law was this. Look at Romans chapter 5, verse 20. Moreover, the law entered that the offense, that is, that's this, uh, another term uh, for your sin nature, that the offense might abound. The law entered in, in order that the offense would abound. Now in chapter 7, it explains it a little more thoroughly in verse um, 13. Was that, then, was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid. He's talking about the law. The law just, it was just such a problem. You can go back through chapter 7. That's what I want to do, I, I don't do. And that which I don't want to do, I end up doing. When, I, when Paul put himself under law for uh, not, not a, a way to get into God's family, but once he's in God's family, how to live there. And he was just, the law would kept separating himself in his practice from, the, from all that God provided in order to live a righteous life. The law separate because the law says, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. Well, if you're looking at don't do this all day long, what are you going to be thinking about? There must be something on the other side of don't do this that I'm missing, and I'm focusing on that stuff. Oh, you know what Christ's uh, law is? Do, not don't do. Love one another as, I, as I've loved you. Well, that takes supernatural enabling, and, and after the, the day of Pentecost, with regeneration, Christ's spirit joined our spirit. You can love just like uh Christ can because it is him doing the loving through you. So big difference. So here he says this, was that that which is good made death unto me? God forbid. That wasn't that wasn't the purpose is God just, uh, you know, uh, for, 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 for an evil purpose, but it's to show you something else. But this is what it is. But sin, your sin nature, in order that it uh, might appear or be made manifest to be what it really is. That it might appear sin working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceedingly sinful. The purpose of the law was to pour gasoline on your sin nature so that any little spark of, of uh, lust and temptation would ignite into sin and show what you really are. All that the Lord says we can do, what they should have said, all that the Lord says we need all the help in the world. Lord, you're going to have to help us. And yet they, they presumptuously, presumptuously said the opposite thing. But what it demonstrates is Israel is a slice of the pie of humanity. The whole pie had the same virtue or lack of virtue. They had the same inability. And then it says here, he says the commandment. Look at uh, the previous verse, verse 12. It says, wherefore the law is holy and the commandment is holy. Now he mentions the law. The law is, is let's say, all ten commandments. There's actually, if you put in statutes, ordinances, and judgments, all the different aspects of the law. There's about 630 <coughs> rules and regulations. But let's just look at the ten. Okay? So let's look at the, the law. Okay, the ten. But now it singles out one commandment. It says the law is holy. It was separated unto God. It, it showed, demonstrated his character. It was reflective of his character. But then it goes on to say, and the commandment, one particular commandment was holy <coughs> and righteous and good. It was beneficial. Why? If you can just tell your kids, no, don't do that. And you walk away and you just, you know, no, no enforcement of that. Wouldn't that be great? Don't do that. Oh, that'd be great. But that's not how it works. And I want to show you what, what it's talking about, this particular commandment in the context, going back to verse 7. Paul says this, now out of the ten, he's going to take one commandment. And this is a commandment that is the most explosive of all the ten. He says this, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. No, I had not known sin, but by the law... And then he's going to take one particular commandment out of the law, for I had not known, see that word lust, L-U-S-T, strong desire? I had not uh, known, experienced strong desire as I did when the law said, don't do this. And then all of a sudden, that's all I wanted to, to think about and have strong desires over. The law, uh, um, let me pick it up here again. I had not known the sin nature, 
uh, to this degree, but by the law, for I had not known lust, except the law said, thou shalt not covet. You know, you, you know what the word co covet, we think of, oh, I want this, and I want that, and I want that. That's, that's true, particularly with the word covet, but you know what the English word covet is translating? The same word that you have in the, the line right above it, translated lust. It's epithumia both times. You know what the Ten Commandments said? Don't even think about it. You know that a prelude to thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not uh, 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 murder, uh, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, all of those activities, the prelude to that was don't even have a strong desire concerning that. I can't even start, and I'm guilty. And that's what that's what the tenth commandment was before. Don't do these things. Don't even think about it. I use this as a uh, use an illustration. I think it was maybe last week in the, the, the message because we're going over uh, the, the how the, the distinctions between uh, uh, the law and grace, the Old Testament, New Testament. New Te Old Testament is fine. It's good. It has purpose and everything, but it's not where we live because we have things far better, as it says in in Hebrews. And so I was illustrating this and said, we had a grandkid, and we told grandkids, you know, when they're over at the house, we told them kids when they're growing up, now you don't do this, you don't do this, you don't do this. Well, we had one particular grandson, and he was in the service, and so I asked my class, I said, there's one particular one, I think, and she goes, yeah, that was Ben. Ben, was, uh, ben Mason was sitting in the back row back there. He's in eighth grade now, but he was a little kid. He still has this propensity. He's a, he's a type of person, he always wants to analyze something. So if you have something, uh, say it's some delicate decoration or thing, he wants to see how it works or how it comes apart or everything, and this is a kid you don't want to touch anything. <laughs> so we tell him, don't touch about it, don't touch it. And then we add a stipulation to kind of draw back even further, don't even think about it. <laughs> and at the age he was at the time, I don't know why he would say it, uh, if he was told that enough or whatever, but he would repeat this, or maybe he would say it to his, his siblings, that, don't even stink about it. <laughs> but you know, with our possession of, of a sin nature, even after we're saved, uh, we're going to experience struggle to, to be able to have those correct thoughts so then we can proceed to those righteous activities down here on earth. And so we have to know, we have to have correct uh, uh, thinking uh, realize that correct thinking is uh, we're going to experience conflict. There's going to be conflict in that. We've looked at Matthew chapter uh, 15, verses 18 uh, through 19, and Jesus said the question was eating with unwashed hands. What's going into you? Oh, you're defiling you. And Jesus says, no, it's not what goes into you defiles you. Because that's all taken care of uh, bodily elimination and so forth. That doesn't defile you. He says what defiles a person is what comes out of the heart. And then he says this, he says, for within the heart is evil thoughts. Well, in, in your life, in your heart as a Christian, you have other thoughts too, you have good thoughts, but there's some competing thoughts that, that are absolutely contrary to that. And uh, it, then, as we said uh, in the previous message when we mentioned this, it said, uh, uh, for out of the heart proceed evil thoughts. Well, how do you see a thought come out of a heart? Well, the next six things are all activities. They're all actions. So they begin as thoughts, and he says, does that defile you while being in you? No, it's when it comes out as an activity. So it's the process from coming uh, from within with this, this uh, uh, mental activity is going on. That's the place to have uh, victory before it turns into an activity, an unrighteous activity, which is called sin. When you... Uh, we have that, that conflict between the, the, the spirit uh, and our, uh, our flesh, which is another word for the sin nature. We have that mentioned in uh, Galatians 5.16. Uh, 5.16 says, if we walk by the spirit, we wouldn't uh, fulfill any, even one, one uh, desire of the flesh. But the, flesh is, uh, the spirit is, is lusting against the flesh, and the flesh is lusting against the spirit. There are good lusts. There are good strong desires. Jesus, before he went to the cross, he said when he instituted uh, the Lordian table, uh, what we call it, the, the, the event of the Last Supper, the Passover Supper, he, he says, I have lusted 
to, now they don't say that in the English because lust is always given a negative connotation. But if, when Christ is lusting, is it a negative thing? Is it a bad thing? No, simply strong as I really wanted to, to come to this point for this event. The Holy Spirit really has a strong desire that is contrary to the things of the sin nature. And there in uh, verse 17 of Galatians 5, it says, And the sin nature has, uh, has strong desires that are contrary to the Holy Spirit. And when you just leave these things together, the Holy Spirit's strong desires and the flesh's uh, strong desires, guess which one wins? Just in, in this realm. The sin nature will always win. When it says you can't do what you desire to do under this circumstance. It's when you go back to the previous verse where it says walk by the Spirit and you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. Now it doesn't tell you all the detail about walking uh, by the Spirit. So that's what we want to look at next. And that is when we understand that we can experience conflict, we need to understand the course of evil uh, lust and temptation, evil strong desires. And that's going to be found in James chapter 1. James chapter 1. And uh, verse 14 and 15, it gives us the, the, the process of uh, unrighteousness from the area of the thought process to finally an act. And then as the act is unimpeded, what that will finally result in. And so it says in these two verses, verse 14, that every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lusts and enticed. Lust is a strong desire. So I have a strong desire. It's a negative desire. It, 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 has, uh, it, it, it has an unrighteous connotation and so forth. So I'm thinking of something that isn't a good thought. Uh, the thought comes into my mind, and it's a strong desire. And by the way, you can be really doing well for the Lord and thinking right and everything, and you get a thought in your mind, you go, where did that come from? And you're scandalized. And you know, if you don't realize that it's in the thought process that God has provided everything that you can be victorious in, and I've seen this, Christians not knowing that they are not guilty when they're processing these evil thoughts, if you don't know that that's, that's where you need to, to uh, be utilizing, recognizing that there's a problem mentally, and utilizing God's provisions mentally, you're going to succumb and go, well, I'm thinking it, I might as well do it. And that happens. And that shouldn't happen, because this passage here tells us that's just where it's getting started. So that you have a strong desire, it can scandalize you, this, this, this strong desire about some, something evil, and then it, it, it uh, uh, proceeds to the point, what's called a pyrazo or temptation, which is, is a solicitation, it's a solicitation to be thinking about the possibilities of how this would work. Uh-huh, okay. So it, it's not just a, a thought of a, a, an unrighteous, uh, thing, an unrighteous activity, but now it's kind of mulling it over and looking at it from all sides. Now it's the area of temptation. And then it says in verse uh, 15, then when lust has conceived, now what's happening is lust, there's a strong desire, now it becomes this, this area of, of uh, uh, pyrazo, of uh, temptation, of a solicitation to be thinking over the possibilities. And when it says lust conceives, lust has gone from here to temptation, and now it's going to produce something. It starts with the lust, it's going on this process. Now at this point, it's going to produce an activity. There's a determination. From other scriptures, we put together what this lust conception, lust, uh, lust in the, in the, at this point of being conceived, it's going to bear an, an activity, it's going to bear a child, and the child's going to be an act of sin. But it's not there yet, hasn't produced the action. What other scripture we put that together, this is what is called trespass. This is where you've made a determination. This is like Adam. Now, my brother said this this morning, and I remember hearing him saying this, and we've been saying this again today, and, and, and he says, it, we, we t uh, talk about our mind saying, I want to do that. Well, nobody says that. It's not being verbally communicated. It's all up here. It's all up here. 
This is where the, the trespass is going on. If my facial expression could show it, and many times it doesn't, I looked around, got these, I went from lust to temptation, and now, and nobody may know anything that's going on in my mind. Then, if, when lust is conceived, and, it, and, and nothing stops it, the policeman doesn't pull you over before you go in and rob that bank or whatever. You've determined you're on your way, but but the circumstances are something. And sometimes, you know what, the, circumst the circumstances are called by God. And I look back, and if you want some more tears, uh, th those times in our lives when I could have done what my friends were doing, and they were already in God. Come on, Mark, let's do that. And something happened where God, it wasn't me. There was circumstances that intervened and said, Mark, you're not going there. And unless that happens, there's going to be a, a, an act, and it's going to be an act of sin, and, and 1 John tells us that sin is has the character of lawlessness, acting as if God doesn't have any requirement. Now, I'm just going to act like God didn't, doesn't care about what I do in this situation. That's lawlessness. That's also called sin. And then it goes on to say, that when sin has finished, and that word finished means uh, 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 it, it, it's come to a full end. In other words, this act of sin proceeds in, in now a continuing activity which now becomes a lifestyle. Well, what does God do to you as a believer because he loves you so much? Whom the Lord loves, Hebrews chapter 12, he chastens. He corrects, and if the correction isn't being heeded, he, he moves on to the ultimate, and he scourges every son that he welcomes alongside. Come on home. And I've seen this happen, or I've heard of it. I, I should say I've heard of it. In a couple of cases, there's a young fella in uh, Tim's, mother, uh, Tim's mother and father's church in Green, Iowa. Uh, a, a young fella, and I'm not going to get involved, but, but, but you could, in fact, you go, that guy probably isn't a believer. Until an untimely, uh, uh, early death takes place, and you go, you know what? But, and I'm just looking at it from my point of view, because I'm not the heart more, because maybe he was a believer, and this, this is why it happened this way. Almost scared, well, it is scared, and that's what it should be. Okay, that's, that's that. We need to understand that in this uh, course of thinking, we want to think correctly. There's, you're going to experience conflict. This is going to be the uh, uh, a course of, of how this continues. And we need to take care of it at this point of, uh, of the area of our thinking. Someone has said it this way. You can, uh, you can think uh, these naughty thoughts, and you can actually start considering them and uh, being tempted uh, and what it's like, uh, when we first came out to Oregon, we went out to, uh, man, I even forget the name of the point, but it was uh, somewhere on, on the coast. And it was, uh, in fact, Joel and Linda, I think, took me out there the first time I came out to visit the, the seminar. We didn't move out here yet. I just came out to kind of explore what this is like and everything. They took me. We went to this one Oswald West State Park, or near Oswald West on the coast, and we went out to this cliff area, and it was like 500 feet down. It was spectacular. Having thoughts in your head where you continue, you don't do anything about them. It, uh, it's been explained this way. It's like having a, a, a basket full of banana peels at that cliff, 500 foot cliff. And I can, I can start walking on them and maybe jumping up and down. And I might not lose my footing. Now, what do you think the percentages are if I keep that up? If I'm going to keep doing that, I'm going to go over the cliff. I mean, it's scary to think about it when I think when I remember what I saw there and how how you could get so close. They didn't have a fence there or anything, and people do that now and then uh, at places like that. Um, jumping on the banana peels. Well, we also have to realize that as we have this conflict in our thinking, we need to realize the course of victory over uh, temptation over this area of thinking. And I want to turn your attention to uh, uh, James chapter 1 in the second verse, and notice what it says. Brethren, 
count it all joy when you fall into various temptations. A couple things here. What I'm, first it says fall. Uh, if, if you're on the area of, of, of planning and proceeding, you're kind of down the road uh, to being tempted probably even into trespass already. So this, this, is, this is when it, you, you're just kind of, you haven't been in, intended on that. This thought comes in, and, and pretty soon, man, I'm even considering that. When you realize that at that point, now you can realize it at, at lust, you can realize it at temptation. Here it says temptation. What should you do? And you realize it? Count it joy. What in the world is that about? Jump down to verse 12. Blessed or happy is the man that holds up under temptation. For when he is uh, 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 tried, he shall receive the crown of life. Being, being, holding up under temptation, realizing what it is, and using what we're going to mention, 1 Corinthians 10.13, uh, 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 no temptation has taken you, but it's common to man. You think you're the lone ranger in this particular area? I know a lot of people does. No one else understands what, what I've been through, what I'm going through, the pressures. And so when I let go and go ahead and do this, man, it's just because nobody knows the trouble I see. You know, nobody. But no, it's common. Maybe not. In fact, a lot of things are that we're sitting here and I don't know your background, I don't know your life, I don't know your thoughts, and you don't know mine. And you know what? That's why I want to keep it. I want to know all this, the, the stuff that's going on, the, 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 the negative content in your life. I want to encourage us together to, to be thinking the right thing. So let's count it all joy. And if we use God's resources, where uh, in, back in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, he's made a way of escape. He's dependable. He's made a way of escape that we can hold up under it. Not that the temptation will all of a sudden disappear, but that while it's still there, I can be holding up under it according to a, a way out that he's designed and provided for me as a grace believer. And, when, and if I do this and I come out on this side, you know what I qualify for? We all get to the day of rejoicing that will be, and what will we get to do? But it's going to be the opportunity once we're glorified. If we qualify in using our our eternal life, Christ living out in us, and we've allowed that life to be directed out through us, in this case, using his life uh, to be able to live victoriously while while spirit while going under a temptation, when we come out on the other side. We have used his life to do that, and we're, we, we're qualified for a crown, a victor's wreath, that demonstrates his life. You utilize this. You, you receive this crown because you utilize the provisions that he has provided you in your so great salvation. According to Hebrews chapter 10, that's our salvation is so great. You've used that, and uh, now when we're all before the throne, and it, it, you're sitting there, in the uh, seat of the 24 elders, you're going to be one of them. It's in courses. You can go through the whole body of Christ. You know, somebody's going to sit there, and uh, on, on their occasion, I mean, I, I've tried to figure this out minute-wise and everything with how many potential believers there are and so forth, and, and uh, how this can boom, boom, boom. You know, just a couple minutes, a new 24 sitting there, and, and uh, uh, going through this process again and again, and every one of us, uh, as members of the body of Christ, having qualified for a crown by his life and by his grace, not because of me. I, you know what we're talking about now <coughs> today, about him going to uh, seminary and, and yielding and me going to, to Bible college. And you know what all that is? It isn't God looking for some great people that he can use. All he wants is willingness. He just wants somebody to say yes. Let me do what I want to do. You young people that are, that are here this morning, I think of this now as I'm getting older. We keep moving off the scene, and as we get older, we go home. And I was wondering, who's the next one? Who will be the other ones to be filling the pulpit here? And you know, I don't have to make any young people feel guilty. Or God will do all that. But I'm just so glad that as he's done it with me as a young person, and he's done it with the older fellows, with the Dr. Schaefers and so forth, as they were young fellows, and they came went through the same process. It's God doing it. 
And, and what is he looking for? Uh, a championship boxer of the, the, the city of Denver or something like that? No, somebody who will just say yes, yes. That's all he wants from you young people. And you adults, and me, I'll put the mirror up and talk to me again. Just say yes. You'll, you'll probably go through the struggle that we've heard this morning, uh, at least us adults heard, but it's just to say yes. Well, we count it all joy, we're, uh, if, and if we endure, use God's provision, we're going to get a crown of life. And that's why before the, the, the whole scenario is playing out, we can go, joy, I can enjoy, this is difficult, but really it, it's, I'm going to have to be uh, thinking and utilizing and yielding and so forth uh, to the Lord. But it's an opportunity. By the way, you'll never have these opportunities after the rapture. You will never be able to glorify the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in this particular way, having supernatural resources, supernatural divine life, and having a, a sin nature at the same time, having conflict and choosing to have victory over your conflicting evil. You'll never have that opportunity again. So there's only this brief snapshot called life that you will ever have this opportunity to glorify God in this man. So what is the, the process? Well, and I'm just going to, uh, if I can, keep quoting here because of, of, of time and so forth. Um, first, We've, we've said this before, we said this yesterday, reckoning yourself when we were going over the, the various ways that God sees us to be in his son. Uh, the first way we, we mentioned is that we're dead to our sin nature. 24-7, that's why God always says, Mark, frame your mind on this and don't let it go. Don't, okay, I'm doing this, I'm doing this, but my framework back here. And, I know, and if, if something happens where I'm all of a sudden, I really am focused or something, a, a lust uh, uh, grabs my attention. What is that general framework back here? Now I've got to move up here and start focusing on in particular attention. I'm dead to sin. I'm dead to my, where am I dead to myself? <coughs> in Christ. So my body's down here and my mind goes way out through the, the three, uh, into the third heaven, out through the atmosphere, through the uh, universe, and there in the north, the true north, celestial north, there in the third heaven, I can see myself. I can count myself to be there where my father counts me to be in his son. And so it says in, in uh, Romans 6 and 11, reckon yourself, count it true that you're dead to your sin nature. And then not simply stopping there, but that then you're alive unto God in your position in Christ. It says in Christ. You're reckoning this, you're counting this true where? This is true in, in Christ. I've heard about it before. I know it. I don't think about it all the time. But boy, when I uh, uh, recognize that, that I'm in, in a, a, a lust or, or a, a, to the point of trust, uh, excuse me, uh, temptation, I this is this is the opportunity I have. And as I grow as a Christian, I'm going to come to the point where I go, here it is again. I get to exercise God's life for His glory. And maybe when I'm younger and I'm, I'm not putting all of these things together all the time, it's just here's the here's the solution. That's how he sees me. And so I focus on that. I focus on that. How long do I focus? I keep focusing on that. As long as I can still understand the conflict in my mind uh, that, that's going on at the same time that I'm framing up, up my, my mind, mental things I'm thinking about, I'm still, this, this, this uh, inner conflict is still going on. I'm still focused on death. God sees me to be dead. And that's so true because in a little while, I'm, I'm going to actually experience 24-7. That's going to be the, the actual material uh, aspect of me. I'm going to be glorified. Why, if that's going to happen in a little while, how foolish is it to think that that's not valuable? And so I'm, I'm framing my mind on that, and then this, I'm still going, the temptation is still existing. And then it says in Colossians chapter 3, verse 5, mortify your members which are here on earth. What was it? Was my sin nature affecting my hand? Certainly my mind, my feet, some member of my body, whatever that was, I need to 
yield that member as a weapon of righteous activity to God. Let God be the one who administers that particular... Let's, let's just cut to the chase here. Because we're probably all thinking about, about uh, sexual lust and so forth. How do you uh, uh, render your, the member of your body that, that's being affected, your hormones and so forth? God knows the, the, the right time and the right situation for this uh, part of my f uh, physical being to be expressed in the right circumstances. I want him to, to have the glory in it and all be uh, uh, my body function effectively for his glory at his time and in the right way. And so, whatever member it is, mind, ears, heart, whatever member, I'm yielding that as a weapon to God that he can be glorified. And I'll continue, I need to continue doing that. And then it says, Joel mentioned this last night, Romans uh, 8.13, and by the way, uh, let's refresh ourselves and just read the verse again. The more we know it, the more it can come to mind, and you'll know. Now, when you put to death your members here on earth, this is what you're doing. You're not, you're simply yielding your members. You're, you, what are you doing? What do we say already? Just say yes. You take whatever is being affected. You take it, Father. It says here in verse 13 of Romans chapter 8, For if you live according to the flesh, you shall die. And that's, that's the progression. You're, you're, if you keep on without... Uh, uh, infecting 1 John 1 9 and stopping that at that one sin or two or three if you let it go on you're going to be taken home early and so you will die and that's what it says here so it says it a couple times in the New Testament about if you want to keep sinning as a Christian okay it's your choice but don't expect to be around here too long and by the way I've seen some people's activities and I go whether well, a professed believer and that seems awful slow about chasing. I don't see any correction happening, and I know that activity isn't right, and it's overt, it's not in their mind. Two things. Number one, they may not be a believer, and so God isn't going to chase him. The world's children, just his own. The other thing is, I, Mark, doesn't know that God's timing and knowing uh, all that they know or don't know, and, and I don't know all the details, so Mark, don't try and figure out the timing for that person. Professed believer, possibly a true believer, don't try and figure it out. Just keep watching myself. Encouraging them if I can, and, and strictly as I can, but uh, uh, take care of myself. Now it says this, for if you live after the flesh, you shall die, but if through the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, uh, you shall live. But how do you do that? Through the Spirit. The Spirit takes over the fight. I simply say yes. You take my hands. You take my head. You take my feet. You take my body. And you use it for your glory. I'm focused on that. I'm still thinking of things, of, 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 of being dead to sin to my sin nature, separated from it, that's what it means, I'm separated from it because I'm focused on things up here and my sin nature is going, all right, Mark, I'm going I don't want to look down here. I don't want to look and pay attention to that. I don't want to answer the door. When it's knocking, I'm going to keep thinking and I'm alive under God. What do you want me to do? And use my members as weapons of righteousness and the Holy Spirit the indwelling Holy Spirit will take over from that point and put, he'll mortify, he'll put to death. Now, it doesn't tell us how long, however long that temptation persists. The Holy Spirit's job is to put to death that uh, temptation, that the sin nature. And he's not going to eradicate you, he puts it to death by uh, keeping you separate keeping you separate. Now, correct thinking also involves cleansing. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1. Because there's self-cleansing and then there's a cleansing by God. 
And I'm simply going to refer to this, the first one. We're not going to say a lot about it or get into too much detail here. We're going to go into the previous chapter, but uh, to chase down the promises, and the promises are good. But he says uh, in verse, uh, chapter 7, verse 1, having therefore these promises, and you're going to have to go back into the previous context to plug that in. Actually, you don't have to go too far. It's, it's, uh, the promise of him not being your father, but acting as a father. And you acting as sons and daughters, it says here. This is one of the few places where, uh, actually, this is uh, coming from an Old Testament quote. So, uh, but, but that aside, we don't want to get into the weeds too far here. It says, having therefore these promises, 2 Corinthians 7, 1, dearly beloved, let us cleanse. And who's doing the cleansing? We do it. We cleanse ourselves. Now, what's this about? All this is talking about is what we just said. It's using God's way of escape. It's thinking on things above. It's, it's focusing on this one particular thing about this thing above, that I'm dead to my sin nature and I'm alive unto God in Christ. And then I'm yielding my members down here on earth while this process continues. And when I'm doing that, I'm in the process of cleansing myself from what? <coughs> and it says, from all filthiness or pollution of the flesh and spirit. The pollution coming up, coming up from my uh, uh, sin nature, and it's, it's affecting the realm of my logical thinking. Not the mind of Christ, but in, in, the, mo in, in the mind, uh, uh, the, the uh, uh, pollution of that area of, of our human spirit. So we can do it by using God's way of escape by thinking correctly, by utilizing that, and that's going to put to death that particular strong desire that has possibly gone into a level of temptation. Now I'm going to say this, and that we're not going to try and run and description or anything, but if you get on, go on to the, the level of trespass, your thinking is all skewed, and you aren't able to. Uh, stop it at that point. It's going to be carried out unless God says you aren't going to do what you're determined to do or uh, in, in uh, the circumstances uh, interfere. Now, remember the pile of banana peels? Jumping on them up and down? You can do that. You can do that and you haven't sinned yet. But it's going to proceed to sin. But it's at that point I can count it all joy. I, uh, joy. I can stop jumping up and down on that pile of banana peels, and I can cleanse myself by using God's way out and backing off. And I'm not there anymore at that point of being tempted, solicited to an evil activity. <clears throat> now, if I go ahead and proceed through that process, and we do, any believer, I don't care how mature you are, don't, don't think you're ever, you know, you're never susceptible to an act of sin. <coughs> Check this out. Pulse, I don't care how, pulse, possibility, possibility if there's a pulse. Well, if I go ahead and proceed to sin, no matter how mature I may have arrived, then it tells us in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess that is to say the same thing, homo legato. I, legato, I'm speaking homo, the same thing as God says about what I just did, or what I said. Speaking and doing are all activities. That he will, if I agree with him, I said, this was not right. This is not who I am. This is not who you are, and I'm in, I'm in Christ. And I, I come to that point after I've sinned, and I agree, and I, 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 I'm, I'm agreeing to the Lord with this, he, can, he uh, forgives the sin. And this is within the family. He doesn't kick you out each time and say you need to be resaved. What it is, is a conflict within the family and while you're in the family. You know, he'll never let you go. What he will do is if you want to keep on sinning and sinning as a family member, he doesn't say you can stop being my, my uh, child, my born one. I'm going to withdraw my indwelling. I'm going to correct it to the point that you need correction because you're, going to, you're mine. And you're always mine. If you want to see one of the strongest uh, proofs of eternal security, go to Romans chapter 8, where it says, whom uh, uh, he has predestined 
Uh, he's uh, called and whom he's called, and he's justified and whom he's justified, he's glorified. And I thought I, I was the clever one who figured this out, and the Holy Spirit taught me, and then I was reading uh, Louis Berry Chaper in his uh, seven volumes, and it, I don't know where it was, but he said the very same thing. He said, the ones that are uh, fenced out over here, it's the same group. The same, it's not some of those who are fenced out are, are finally called. And then a few of those that are called are finally uh, justified, declared righteous. And some of those, one or two of those will finally be justified. It's the same group all the way through. There's your security. Between that, that portion of Scripture and the um, chastening portion of Scripture, those are the two... Well, not, and they're not the only ones because then we have the, the Ephesians where it talks about the Holy Spirit or sealed by the Holy Spirit under the day of completion. We've got eternal security all over the place, but in light of that, let's be living for the one uh, that that has planned. And, and by the way, what He's planned for us isn't isn't a pain. This is this is the best way to live. And as you live it as a spiritual Christian, you realize that. Wow, this is great. And then. You know, the next day or the next week or next month, I, whatever circumstances and, and the effects of the sin nature and the sin nature is still knocking at the door, say, Mark, I'm still here, and boy, your body's crying out for this. And for instance, my, my thinking goes askew again. And so this is ongoing all the time. But when I sin, and I confess my sin, and God forgives the sin, it says something else, and he cleanses us. He's the one who's cleansing us from all the unrighteous activities that finally led to an activity called sin. He cleans all of that up. And so, from God's standpoint, <coughs> he doesn't go, well, I think, like, you know, Mark, I'm, I'm not considering that I've sent that, that uh, act of lawlessness away. But boy, it still bugs me that, that you, you have these thoughts. No, it's all cleansed, and he cleanses us. He cleanses us of those the effects from that particular activity when we confess our sin. Now, let's keep running along here. <clears throat> we come to our third point up here. Correct thinking involves God's enabling. Philippians 1, 6. He who has begun a good work in you. Is we think that, we, we can think that, okay, I'm the one who has to go through this struggle alone. You're going through a struggle with these conflicting ways of thinking and thoughts. But you're not alone at all. God's the one, Philippians 1, 6, great promise, direct faith toward it, collect on it. He's going to keep working on you, the one who's begun a good work, until the day of Jesus Christ. Until the rapture, he's going to continue a good work. It also says in Philippians chapter uh, 2, the second chapter, verses 12 and 13, it says, but it is God who works in you both uh, yeah, energized, I think it's, it's not, I'm not going to get into particulars there, works in you both to be willing and doing of his good pleasure. So God the Father is the one who enhances and works in the realm of your desirous will. He gives you the want to. And not only does he give you the want to, that verse says he causes you to be will, uh, desirous and doing, energetic. He gives you the energy, the will and the energy to do a, what pleases him. Where do I come in? He gives me the want to. He gives me the energy to be able to fulfill the want to. What do I bring to the table? Okay, let's do it. Here again. Let's, yes, Lord. Yes. Once again, and every time. Yes. I agree. Do what you want to do. Through me. And I'm going to use your enablement to keep that rubbish out of my, uh, uh, from my sin nature that's affecting my spirit. I'm going to be focusing on my position in Christ in those areas that will affect uh, how I uh, handle my uh, uh, situation and those uh, conflicting thoughts. Then we come to uh, the fourth point here. Correct thinking involves growth. Second Peter chapter 3, 18. The last thing, the very last thing Peter ever writes. But grow in grace 
and in the experiential knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Whenever you were saved, it didn't all happen to you, obviously. It's an opportunity to grow. And it's a need to grow. And you will be growing until you take your last breath, or at least you'll, you'll be experiencing the need, and he will uh, provide the provisions. But it's, it's an ongoing process. I said this at a pastor's retreat one time, and they were uh, talking about uh, uh, implementing different programs. And the programs kind of drive me crazy. So I thought, oh, this is a need. It's put in these programs. And, and, and I was one of the last guys, possibly the, the thing was about over and everything, and I had just raised my hand and said, you know, I said it, it's um, to, to be able to, to uh, do what we, what we would like to do. It's like shooting at a moving target, trying to get everybody on board to accomplish this. And I said, I said this is how I understand it. I said, there are people that are just believing the gospel and, and being born into God's family. And on the other end, you have older saints who are <coughs> leaving this earth and going home. And in between here and there, you have levels of growth, levels of maturity or immaturity or carnality. You have carnality and spirituality <coughs> and different levels of, of attainment at different places. <coughs> what you folks know from Scripture, and hopefully you, you, you process that, you, you're understanding it, you're counting it precious, and you're implementing it into your activity. Hopefully you don't do this. To the people across the street or wherever, that there are... Uh, true born-again believers, they're down on the ladder of understanding. They're behind you. You're up on this ladder of maturity, a little higher on the rungs of, of the ladder of maturity of spiritual growth, and you look down there. Why are you down there? Yeah, you people. Uh, remember, we're, we brothers. These are our brothers and sisters in Christ. And maybe that's the only thing we have in commonality, and, and, and there could be all kinds of skewed thinking. The skewed thinking is, if, if there is skewed thinking on behalf of brother, sister, in Christ, it's because they haven't gone around that first block correctly in the, in the movement of their maturity. And God wants to use you, and he can't use you when, you've got this, when we've got this attitude of, uh, who needs them? They're gonna, if, if they're born again, if anybody's born again, and they're, they're going to be in heaven too, and they're going to be glorified to the very same degree. And it's not because, oh, Mark, you learned so much stuff, and and and, da, 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 and they were just schlubbed spiritually. They're right up there too. You know why? Because Jesus Christ's death was so sufficient that God could provide a salvation. That even though you receive or you enter into that uh, family relationship here on earth by the new birth, and you mess up most of your life, that by God's grace on the basis of the complete and totally more than sufficient price that Christ paid, God the Father is going to glorify us to that degree. How? We're not worth it. No, it's by grace. How can you be gracious? Because of my Son. Part of the Christian life's maturity is realizing how powerful the sacrifice of Jesus Christ really is. And it's when you see, and we all experience the glorification at the rapture of every believer to the same degree, we're going to come experientially to a point that we haven't probably fully come to in this lifetime of how sufficient his provision was, or is. And so we're going to be growing. I've got John 15, 8, that, that in 831. They both talk about being disciples. <coughs> and uh, uh, it's interesting. Without turning to John, if you want to, John 15, 8, uh, it talks about producing fruit uh, through the, the vine. You're a branch and you produce fruit, and it's a growing experience. It's fruit in those first five verses, and then it's a, it's a, a, a growth to more fruit production. Love, joy, peace, one, should I sing the song? I'll probably can't get through the whole <laughs> edition. I always have to do that. But producing fruit, more fruit, and much fruit. And then in verse 8, it says that when you're doing this, that you, and Jesus said, if you're feeling at ease, and I, I think it's in my Father, but it's feeling at home, abiding, feeling at home, that then you uh, are, are my disciples, my learners. You're qualified as my learners. Now, a learner isn't one who's, okay, I, I, learned, I read the Bible once. 
and I've got a kind of a general understanding of it, I'm going to go to the library and just get a bunch of novels and read some more stuff or some more information because I've got I'm done with this one. No, it's not a one-off. It's learning. And Jesus said, you are my learners. It says in chapter 8, uh, verse 31, in relationship to the truth that will make you free, and in that context is free from the, the, the enslaving power of your indwelling sin nature. He says, if you continue in my word, and I was talking to uh, Jewish believers in this group before the cross and before the day of Pentecost, but he says, if you continue to feel in my word, then you are my disciples or learners indeed. You're truly my learners. You can jump off the learning bus anytime you want to as a boy. And God's going to use chasing to get you back on the learning bus. And you need, and you and I, in fact, Paul said uh, in Philippians chapter 3, he says, I haven't arrived yet. Three verses later in chapter 3, he says, I'm, I am mature. I, I've uh, relatively arrived, I'm relatively mature, but even at that point, Paul couldn't say, I'm, I'm absolutely finished. I, I've learned it all, I've put it all into practice, and every day of my life, I've, whew, I'm there. No, that is until the rapture. The last thing we want to focus on is correct thinking involves forgetting. What's that about? If you're trying to think right, what do you, what do you forget? Well, Paul says, and let's go to uh, Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. And verses 12 through 14. We are closing. We are running to the finish line here. Give me verse 12. All right. It's interesting. I, I, I study out of my inner linear and I preach out of the old skull field, so it's never on the same page. Philippians chapter 3 and verse 12, not as though I had already attained or were already finished, <coughs> completely matured, but I pursue, I follow after, if that I may lay hold of, he wants to lay hold of, that for which also I am laid hold of, let's see if I can do this, by Jesus Christ. He's laid hold of me into my position, and I'm to lay hold of what he's laid hold of me to be able to put it into my practice. And that's what Paul is saying here. I want to lay hold of that for which I'm laid hold of, uh, apprehended of concerning Christ Jesus. Verse 13, brethren, I count not myself to have completely laid hold of. But this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. How God sees you and I right at this very moment this Sunday morning here in Central uh, Oregon uh, uh, Oregon, uh, Oregon, Washington, whatever. <laughs> March, March, what are we, 12th, th uh, 13th uh, today? 11th? Oh, that's yeah, the, no, that's the, but at the point we are, physically and time-wise, I can be apprehending reaching for that prize of what I'm going to actually end up at. And that's what Paul's expressing here, and in apprehending or going for, reaching for those for those things, he says this, I want to forget the things that are behind me. Just going to mention this quickly. It's interesting in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 when Paul mentions uh, the resurrection and he mentions uh, those who saw the resurrected Lord first and he, he, he starts to enumerate these people. He was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. This is uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 5. After that he was seen of about 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part at the time Paul's writing this is still alive. Uh, but some are falling asleep, verse 7. After that he was uh, he was seen of James. This is his half-brother. Jesus' physical half-brother. Then he was seen of James. Then of all the apostles. Uh, and last of all, he was seen of me, Paul, as one born out of due time. And then he says this, for I am the least of the apostles. I'm not fit to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. Did he ever forget that? No. 
Did he realize what God's grace did to him? Yes. And so in doing that, he could forget. It wasn't something that was a guilt cloud hanging over Paul, even though from a, a human point of view, I was, I was killing Christians and all these others. I was persecuting them, these first believers who'd seen Christ. From a human point of view, I am the least. And yet it's interesting when, when he gets into a, a Second Corinthians, he talks about himself. He knows God's speaking through him and using him, and he's on par with any, any other apostle there. That's what he says in, in the Second Corinthian letter. But, but when he stands back, he goes, from where I came, I'm not worth it. But in Philippians chapter 3, he says, forgetting those things. Forget them. I don't know what's happening in your life. As a believer, we're not going to get into a, a confessional here. I'm not going to call in. You don't have a baptistry here? Go over here. No, we can that. Back here. <laughs> and pretend that that's a confessional and you come up and we'll draw a curtain and you tell me all your and then you do anything. That's between you and the Lord. Once it's forgiven, forget it. <coughs> One of the biggest things, problems that Christians have is, is letting go of a, of a situation that God has taken care of. Now, you might have to live with the consequences, but you can live with the consequences in God's grace. Let go of those things of the past. So if we're going to have correct thinking in order to be able to act correctly, uh, have a basis where those uh, have having... Uh, good thoughts coming out of the heart uh, and, and uh, in, in, in uh, the light of, of the various activities, righteous activities that we can do. We need to realize that we're going to have conflict in our thinking, but that we have uh, a thinking that God has provided uh, defense, protection, cleansing, enabling, and that we can focus with ease on things above, things that are true, sensible just, pure, lovely, well-reported, virtuous, praiseworthy, all of those things that involve the Christian life and that involve our position in Christ and that involve the fruit of the Spirit and that involve who God is and that involve our promises and that involve all those things that are revealed in the New Testament for you and me as New Testament believers. That, now I can start thinking of those things and it's interesting if you look, and I'm not going to do it yourself, Philippians chapter 4 verse 9, Paul says after, he says, think on these things. He says, uh, those things that you saw and heard, uh, and there's two other things that you did. Uh, Paul said, remember who I was and what I said and what I did. And do them. You do them. Verse 8 precedes verse 9. Think this way. And then the, what you, how you saw, that mindset, that mentality, those good thoughts, that thinking process worked out in my life in activity. You do the same thing. You do it. You do it. Heavenly Father, use your word to our benefit to glorify yourself as you have again and again. Thank you for what you've done, what you're doing, what you will do.